They all know sign language. Congratulations. Yay. Do you want him to move out of the way? Yes, folks. Oh, 
I guess we can tell them. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a noisy person. No, sorry. I looked over and he goes. <laughs> Kidding. Don't break the All right, all right, all right. All right. Seven, six, five, four. Beautiful. Three. Three. Two. One. Cheese. Pepper. Yes, 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 Pepper. Oh, bad. Trevina, are you using mine? <laughs> yeah, I just took a picture of my face. You may want to delete that. <laughs> liar. Liar. No, you need to go to Penny no, the Altar, young man. I know, I just saw her. Alright, so it seems to be that my computer's working now, so we'll be ready in a minute. Okay, I love I thought that the uh, thumb drive right when I put it in would work and it would be a countdown of 10 minutes before we start class, but um, because it just started working, we're just going to go ahead and uh, get into it any minute here, but um, once a month, we don't do this every Sunday, but we do this once a month. Um, I'm sure you, uh, once you hear the once a month part, you kind of suspect what's coming up here, but it, it is all up to you. We do an offering to support the deaf ministry. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and stand up and pray. I pray, God, for the offering in support of the deaf ministry. God, I pray that this money would be used for the deaf ministry. And I pray that you would anoint Brother Nolan and give him your word so that he can teach us so that we can learn your word and be able to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's quick. It's quick, easy. All right. So I, I think it will be done in about less than two minutes, at least with the offering. Um, every Sunday, uh, it's more or less the same. I use the uh, PowerPoint projector here, uh, share some scriptures. Um, occasionally, there's some pictures um, in, in the PowerPoints, um, but it's, most of the time, it's, it's mostly scriptures. <laughs> that's how I've done it in the past. But last night, uh, I was getting ready uh, and setting up the PowerPoint here, and uh, something came to mind. And I thought it was a pretty neat idea, uh, but I thought nothing more of it uh, while I was setting the PowerPoint up um, and preparing for this morning's lesson, and then I fell asleep. <coughs> so, uh, you know, kept thinking about the idea that I had set aside, and 
decided uh, this morning at least uh, to go ahead and use that idea here. So, all right. Uh, and then of course, second, um, what I normally do is I'll put up scriptures um, and then explain the scriptures. But this morning, there's a lot more pictures than scriptures, uh, more pictures than in the past. So we're, we're using scriptures and pictures um, interchangeably, okay? Uh, thank you, Brother Candido, for praying for this uh, class. So we're going to get started. So uh, if we look in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, uh, I, um, you know, occasionally I'll add a few things here and there when I'm going along. But you notice that the four gospel writers, each of one of them, have they wrote about the life of Jesus, right? So each of them, of course, having slightly different perspectives of the life and ministry of Jesus. But they are all more or less about the same time period of Jesus' life. And what's interesting is if you look uh, at Matthew 24 and, or sorry, four, sorry, not 24, 14. I'm, I'm just seeing if you can catch the sign language here. I'm just making sure you notice the difference, right? <laughs> so Matthew 14. I want you to notice that in Matthew 14, we all know the, uh, the story of when he walked on water. Um, but in each of the four gospels, I believe that it's made mention in three of them. But when Jesus walked on the water, things that he had said, you know, are not exact, you, you don't get the full picture of what's going on, right? One, there's one additional writer that does not say um, more or less uh, or give any cl uh, clear perspective of what was going on. So I feel like Matthew 14 gives the biggest or the, the best uh, example of what happened here. So uh, I want, as we go along, you, it'll create a picture in your mind so you can further understand what this is going at here. Uh, verse 22 says, and straightway, which is almost like immediately, right? I understand the King James Version, the English is 400 plus years old. So straightway is another word for immediately. And straightway, Jesus constrained. It, it, was, it was a command. It wasn't a, uh, uh, a request. And the disciples at that point, uh, you know, accepted Jesus and accepted what he had said. Um, because they were, of course, they were his disciples. They were his followers. And today, we are all his children. So we are more or less the same thing. Uh, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. Um, I mean, it's a, of course, ship, boat, understand, yeah, some of the, some of the English is going to be a little difficult to catch here. So it's a boat. Now, you find this interesting because, of course, we know Jesus is omnipresent. He knows what's going to happen in the future. He already knows what's coming up. And if, if Brother Michael or Brother Candido, if you have any questions or anything you guys want to add, you're more than welcome to throw it at the table. I don't see anybody saying anything so far. So, uh, so uh, the, it continues to read, and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. So these disciples had gotten, this is a clear picture so far, these disciples had gotten into a boat and decided to go towards the other side. And of course, these disciples have no idea what's coming up. They have no idea. The night seems beautiful, it's peaceful, it's quiet. They're going to make that, tr that journey over to the other side. No idea with what's coming up. Verse 23 reads, And when he had sent the multitudes away, <coughs> he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And this is interesting here. <clears throat> and when... Uh, of course, it's the evening here. It says, And when the evening was come, there's no sun out, right? It could be anything from sundown to sun, sunrise. It could be any time in, in between there, right? He was there alone. <clears throat> now, 
now, if you look at the next verse of scripture here, it reads, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea. And I wonder where they were headed. Were they going to another city? I mean, because it was, they just went. <clears throat> Any questions so far? You guys are nice and quiet today. Huh? Oh, he says, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. All right, it's good. <clears throat> Uh, again, the scripture reads, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea. Now they, they are in the midst, they're in the middle of this sea and they don't, there's nothing around them at this point. The next part of the scripture here reads, tossed with waves. Now notice, that's not an actual sign, what I used just now. It's something called classifier. It's, it's, it's taking the place of a word because what I'm doing is I'm creating an illustration. So I'm saying, so there is a, this is a ship and tossed. This is tossing that ship. This is the ship right here with my left hand and it's, this is being tossed around by the waves, right? And they could, they could have been, you know, hey, hey Jesus, why'd you send us out? You know, who knows, but. Uh, the, uh, tossed with waves, scripture continues, for the wind was contrary. It was, it was powerful. The wind was howling. It was, it was a strong wind. Okay? So, so far we're getting an, a picture of what's going on at this current part of the, of the, the chapter. Right. So these winds are buffeting the ship. Now, what, what season it is, I don't think it's mentioned. But uh, Brother Mike was saying there's no hurricane ever in Israel. I don't think there's a precedent historically for hurricanes in Israel. So uh, it could have just been a storm, a, a big storm. Verse 25. Now I want you to look here. And in the fourth watch, so, uh, I want you to notice that right there. In the fourth watch of the night, that, that, right, that phrase right there. Understand, again, this is old English, King James Version, 400 years old. Question is to you, what do you think that, what, what do you think that means? Oh. That right there makes a big difference, right? So if it's, <clears throat> it's a, if, it, if it's the fourth hour, which means, that means you count from, of course, if it's the fourth hour of the night, you start from a certain time period and you count four hours past that time, right? But this says, instead of hour, it says the fourth watch of the night. So this is generally referring to three or six o'clock in the morning, okay, right before the sun rises, right? It's not right after sunset, but right before sunrise, okay? This is about three to six o'clock in the morning, okay? Notice here, uh, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Notice that the, Jesus was walking towards the this, this ship through the storm on the sea. No, no, nothing. Oh, you want to say something? Can't see. About the time, the fourth, the fourth hour of the night. Fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch of the night is is approximately right three to six o'clock in the morning, right? So it's for anywhere anywhere between that time period is the fourth watch of the night. Somewhere right right before sunrise, okay. You know how when, when the disciples were, you know, when they had were infill, where they got the infilling of the Holy Ghost and they said, you know, it is only the fourth hour of the day. Uh, we're not drunk as you suppose, suppose because it's only the fourth hour of the day. Notice, I want you to notice that word hour in that particular phrase here is counting from six o'clock in the morning. You count four hours from six, it'll be about 10 or nine. Or it's in the third hour, sorry. It's in the third hour of, of the morning. So if you count from six, it'll be nine in the morning, right? So is it, if it says the ninth hours, ninth hour, then you would go on to about three o'clock in the afternoon, right? So 
the hour makes the difference between hour and watch. Watch is just a time period instead of a specific hour. So this is right before sunrise. Is that clear so far? No questions? No? Okay. We're really quiet. This is going to be a short, a more so short class. Okay. Uh, verse, uh, verse 22 says, they, And immediately commanded the disciples, you know, to get into a ship. So, they were commanded to go on the ship when Jesus went up to the mountain. So, when they were out on in the middle of the sea on the ship... It doesn't say exactly which city that they were headed towards. It just says the other side. Right, okay, so, okay. That's what I was wondering. Just the other side of the sea, okay. Jesus... Jesus went to the other side. The, the disciples. Jesus went up to pray while the disciples went to the other side. So the multiple multitudes were sent away. The ship was sent away, and Jesus went over just to pray. Jesus went up to pray while while he had sent his disciples out into the, mid, the the middle of the sea here. Right, but there's it was just to the midst of the sea. There may have been a commandment for a specific city. It's not mentioned here. Right. The next verse scripture here, 26, it says, And when the disciples saw him, this is the first time that they've seen anybody. I couldn't imagine seeing in real life somebody walking on water. I couldn't imagine that. Uh, scripture reads, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, notice here, they, they were what? Right, trouble, scared. Saying it is a spirit or a ghost, right. That's why it's referencing. That. The New King James Version shows this word being ghost. Uh, of course, King James saying it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Verse 27. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. So I'm assuming, I, and of course I'm deaf, I can't hear anything, of course, but I'm wondering, the disciples, of course, were able to identify the voice of Jesus and know his voice. So when he said, It is I, I maybe it may have been a little more difficult to hear through the storm or through the waves. I mean, I have no experience. I don't know. But he says, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. The next, the next verse of scripture here, verse 28. It's interesting because it, it reads, And Peter answered him and said, Lord. Obviously, he was able to identify the voice and say, okay, that is, that's Jesus. Jesus says, it's I, it is I. Peter identifies him as Jesus through the darkness and through the storm and says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question. Maybe we can we talk a little bit about this particular portion of scripture here. Nobody, nobody has any questions or, I mean, you're welcome to say anything you want.
Now, this is not uh, a comic strip that you would find on a Sunday morning. This really did happen, okay? He actually did walk on the water, okay? This was no gimmick. Now, it's important. Gurgling baby. I thought uh, Peter had told Jesus to come. Uh, Jesus had told Peter to come, but it was like Peter had said that he was going to come, but Peter asked. And, okay. Is that clear? Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. In uh, Peter's mind, it, it was a it was a question of it wasn't necessarily a question of what if, right? It was a question of tell me to do this and I'll do it. That's a, essentially what it was, right? Jesus didn't say, okay, you know what? What you need to do is go ahead and strap up that life jacket because you know you never know. Just to be safe, there was no there was no addition to the simple request of a command, right? Peter requested the command. Jesus, of course, reciprocated and gave the command. Come. Right? <coughs> Pretty clear. When we pray to God, we pray in, certain, in a certain manner, and he answers according to that manner. Now, Peter didn't just go strap on a life jacket, buckle it on, and just very slowly make his way over because I mean he could have very well just dropped a, a rock over the edge and it would have sank to the bottom <laughs> understand Peter's a fisherman so he knows the ways of the sea right mm -hmm. oh, this is interesting here notice what he said here this is Peter he may have been a good I don't know if he's a good swimmer or not I mean when he went through the water he was asking for help so obviously he didn't he wasn't a swimmer but he had enough faith to step over the edge, even though he wasn't a swimmer. Same as strong swimmers, if the, the water's bad, they get pulled down. They can't swim. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if they're strong and you can. But when you can't swim, you will. Very possible. Uh, if it was the strong winds and strong waves, I don't think I'd be able to swim. <laughs> now, uh, uh, when Jesus walks on the water, we all understand the laws of nature, right? There's no precedent in the laws of nature there's no precedence that you can walk on water. The laws of nature say you start walking on the water, you're falling right through, right? So when the man walks on the water, it's obvious of his identity. He's God. But you have to remember. God says, I'm not going to give my glory unto another. Right? When Jesus walks on the water, that's not giving glory to him as a body, as a, as a be fleshly being. It's God manifested in flesh receiving that glory. Okay? Now, of course, when, when uh, Peter had requested, you know, bid me to come unto thee, Jesus answers, come. Peter steps out of the boat and, and begins to walk on the water according to the command. It's that simple. That's interesting what he said. Yeah, it says, uh, it, it, you know, once Jesus said, come, all the disciples, it's, it's a curiosity of mine, why didn't all the disciples just jump out? I mean, Peter was the one that did it. Peter was the one that would always come forward and, and, and do and act. It was always Peter's initiative. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, all the other disciples could have been very curious about this whole thing. Peter had a childlike faith, so he right. just simply believed it. Right. He had no doubt in his mind. He had, he was you know there was one hundred percent faith upon command what he was going to do. The, 
Now, a lot of people ask what the difference is between doubt and unbelief. So I, let me ask you, what do you think the difference between doubt and unbelief is? Right? So if you were to stick doubt on one side, and you were to stick unbelief on another, how would you compare them? How would they be different? <coughs> do, you stand, do you understand the question? So unbelief means, of course, you don't believe, and doubt, right? What is the difference between these two here? Uh, they're different, but yeah, that's yeah. great. But does anybody have more of a... Since I see a lot of smoke coming from that head, don't think too hard. Doubt means you believe it's impossible, and unbelief means you're just not sure. Well, let's good. Another way. I think unbelief means you think yourself it's not possible, but doubt, it's like, hmm, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it's possible. But yeah. you're still, you're yeah. still like, hmm, you're not sure. You make excuses. Right. Yeah, doubt yeah. is, doubt is a gray area. You're but, in the middle. But not belief is Right. Unbelief is more concrete. It's more dangerous. Because then you're blind to the truth. If you're in unbelief, it's a dangerous place to be in, right? So here's an image, of course, of Peter stepping out of the boat. Verse 29. Jesus speaking here. And you notice how it's one word. The scripture reads, and he said, Come. It was, it was just that one simple word, simple command. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, and understand this is a, this is a big challenge here. He, was, he, was, he took that, that step out of, of safety, right? But he didn't just step out and hold on to the railing of the ship, right? He, he, he let go of that railing and said, you know, here, I'm coming straight for you. He left the safety of the ship, the safety of the railing. Is there anything you want to add? No. <laughs> Scripture continue, continues to read, out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. His eyes were set on Jesus, right? And it, when his eyes were set on Jesus, he was able to do it. I, I wonder what the rest of the disciples were thinking at that particular moment. Hmm. Uh, Peter, you, I feel like he may have just wanted to walk on the water to get close to Jesus. He wanted to be by Jesus. Right, so the point is, is Peter had initially asked him, bid me come. This was, a, this was a request directly to Jesus, right? He wasn't going to step out on his own. He wanted to do it according to the word of Jesus. And as soon as Jesus had spoke that command, that one, that one word was good enough, Right? <clears throat> Can't see him. Uh, no. So, not necessarily catching on to Jesus, right? The point is, is he wanted to walk towards Jesus. The question was, bid me come. It wasn't, bid me come, I'm going to go row over to you, pull the ship over to you. It wasn't any, excuse me, it wasn't any of that. He had to leave the safety of the ship, right? That, that, that question was, bid me, that question of bid me come was, let me step out of this boat and walk toward your direction, right? Outside of the safety that this boat can have. And then walk towards you. That's that, it's pretty simple. Now, read here, it says, And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked... This is, of course, the second man to walk on water. Who's the third man? We have, I mean, that's a challenge to you. <laughs> but, you, you know, you may be the third person to walk on water. Uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit I don't think I can walk on water. Uh, because, of course, the laws of nature is stuck in, in my head. It's ingrained in me. Well, I mean, you throw a rock into the water and you see it sink to the bottom. That's just the laws of nature. My physical doubt says I'm not going to be able to walk on water. Uh, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Pretty clear? Any questions? Any questions? No? No? Any questions? No? Questions? I think you're, you're getting the point here pretty well. 
Verse 30 here. Now, it reads, But when he saw the wind boisterous or strong, when he saw that strong wind and the strong waves, of course, Jesus is right, just right in front of him. All it took was him to, to, to for his eyes to lead Jesus. And the, you see in the scripture here, it says that he was afraid and beginning to seek. Jesus is not going to, to reach out his hand to catch you unless you cry out for help. Right? That's all it took. Because Jesus knows your situation. And he's very much willing to do more above and beyond what you have requested or asked for. Right? Your situation may seem small and menial, but it's, of course, up to you whether you keep your hands in that situation or you give it to God. Yeah? Okay. So, he was, uh, and beginning to sing, the scripture reads, Jesus is standing on the water directly in front of him. Jesus wasn't sinking. So Peter then, of course, cries out, saying, Lord. Notice here it says, Lord, save me. It just says, save me. If you, if, you're, if you reach out to him with that request, God will come out and save you. Right, that's good. Ask anything in my name. Right, so if, it's, if you don't call his name. Right, so if he's, the scripture reads in, John, in, chapter, in the book of John, it says, yeah, ask anything in my name and I shall do it. Uh, I believe it's verse, is it verse, is it John 14, 14? Or something, John 14? Somewhere around there, so, right. Okay. And I want, I want you to see here. Oh, uh -huh. oh okay. Uh, verse 31 reads, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, and caught him right before he sinks under the the water. Reached forth or stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? It was it was a doubt. It wasn't unbelief. It was doubt. He be, once his eyes left Jesus, he began to question, and that's when doubt creeped in, right? This is a really short um, lesson here, and, I, and I'm going to say a few other things to kind of uh, illustrate my point here. And we all know the, and I, and I know I've shared the story of the ten lepers a few times in here, uh, maybe three or four times. But uh, the point is with the with the story of the ten lepers, they were in a very hopeless situation. They had no hope in life. They had a incurable disease. They were left outside the city. They were not able to mingle with others. Uh, well, remember, yeah, remember what we were talking about this early, earlier. But these ten lepers were in a very hopeless situation. And all it took was for Jesus to walk, not necessarily by them, but close to them. But that's when the, the lepers cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And that's all it took. Okay? All they had to do was cry out to Jesus. They didn't necessarily include any details, but Jesus knew exactly the reason for their, for their request or for their, for their, their pleas. So when they cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, Jesus knew exactly what was going on. And it was, a, it was a request for us. It was a request for more than one person. And they knew that Jesus was going to do it. And by virtue of them crying out and saying his name, asking him in his name was important. And in that time, there's, a, there's some more things I want to share about this. If we notice, at least in the, in the illustration I just showed earlier, Peter could not save himself at this point. At this point, he was going under the waves, and he was in a, in a precarious situation. He cried out, said, Lord, save me. And that's when 
Jesus reached out and saved him. When the ten lepers cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, Jesus knew exactly their situation, their need. And according to that time period, you have to understand, they had a choice upon, when, when Jesus spoke to them at that, at that very moment, they had a choice, right? So when Jesus said, go show yourselves unto the priest, these 10 lepers were not healed at this point. They had a choice at this point. They could either accept it, turn and go, and then as they were going, be cleansed, or they could doubt it, right? But instead, when, they, when Jesus said, go show yourself unto the priest, they understood his request, they, they were still full of leprosy, but as they went, that's my favorite part of the scripture here, it's very important to notice, is as they went, the scripture reads, they were cleansed. Right? They were cleansed as they went. You want to say, you want to add something? It's important to identify how much faith um, is coming from them is at least if we were to parallel in today's you know t time period you know being faithful to church it's easy to look out into the world and become paranoid and panicked but all, all we have to do is just to cry out to Jesus and and know that Jesus will never forsake you and he's always faithful and he's 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 a he's he's very close by the world can cause and the devil can cause a lot of confusion and, and, and fear and anxiety but just to focus on Jesus and have faith on him um, and know that he can save you. And it's not just something that you need to con constantly worry about or wonder about as the world will have, world will have you believe. So Jesus, is, Jesus yeah. is able. That's good. So uh, you, notice, you notice Peter didn't turn around to the disciples and ask for them to bring the ship over and save him. He turned to Jesus, right? Only Jesus can save. So he turned around and asked Jesus for help. So you notice here, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him uh, immediately after Peter had cried to save him. Peter had cried to Jesus and saying, you know, Lord, save me. What, was, he, was Jesus to ignore him? No. At that point, he reached out his hand and, and, and helped him out. Now, understand, if Peter didn't say anything, the fish may have said, you know, hey, welcome back, fisherman. You know, who knows? <laughs> And, uh, of course, uh, verse 32 reads, And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. So it's important that we stay in the ship, we stay in the church, that we don't go test the winds of the world. It's important to stay in the church. Scripture, or verse 33 reads, uh, then, they were, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Any questions? I know this is, is, today was a really short lesson. No? We're good? Any, anything anybody wants to add? No? I think we're done. The other chapter... Um, I like that. The heart oh, of Jesus. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So that the, uh, on the other uh, verse, the Bible says that Jesus spoke to the wind and tells to the stop, see stop. That's what they say, like, who is this man that even the wind listens to him? He spoke to the wind. Right, right, exactly. Everything was to listen to him. The angels have to listen to him. We should be listening to him. We should be listening to his commands. They're not offers, they're commands. And, and we need to listen to them. Yeah. And I wonder what the disciples thought at that particular moment, thinking that one man had the authority over everything. If you look right here in this verse of scripture, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him 
Notice they, they worship the man that had walked on water. They worship the man they saw as God. And they said, of a truth thou art. Notice here, they're speaking to Jesus when they say this. Thou art the son of God. They're essentially, they're saying, you are God. It's powerful. Uh, I'll be done here. Oh, oh. I wanted to say something about, I like that part that says, come, because all of us answer to God. When he calls us, he says, come, follow me. And then we are just willing to follow Jesus. But then sometimes we look around and we're like, ah. And then Jesus helps us be, go through Even uh, additionally, if you look at you know, God told Noah, "Come into the ark." It wasn't go to the ark; it was come in unto the ark. Come, I'm, the, I'm basically the place of refuge. Cool. K E W L. Uh, what, what's interesting here? If you look in the Old Testament, God had said that there is no God beside me, right? So there should be no worship directed towards other beings, right? So when the disciples worshipped him, it's obvious that the man getting the glory was God. Because God had robed himself in flesh. When he became flesh, he accepted the title of the Son of God. See what he's saying. Jesus became flesh and they worshiped him. Right, okay, so if you notice here, worshiped him. If, if, if that was the case, Jesus wouldn't say, no, don't worship me, go ahead and worship God. But notice it doesn't say that here. There's no separation of, 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 of being, right? There's, he, if, if you look right here, it says, Thou art the Son of God, right? You see that. This helps us as far as identifying who Jesus is, right? Now, if it would be son, son who? Son, son of, there's lots of sons, right? Son of God is reference to the, of, uh, you know, to the, the body of Jesus Christ, God incarnate. If all it is is just an identifying feature. That's what it's referring to, right? John, John chapter 6 verse 17 says exactly where the disciples were going where it doesn't mention it in verse 22 of Matthew 14 it doesn't say that I understand like I had mentioned earlier it, the gospel writers wrote about similar situations and some of the information was left out in one where it was covered in another so if you read them all you get a more full account of what was going on but no notice in, in one of the accounts it doesn't say anything about Peter walking on water it just says Jesus was walking on the water and then the, you know, the, the waters was calm so it's, a, it's important to see the different perspectives of these stories, right? I guess I am done here. If you look at verse 18, it says, you know, they were, they were going to their destination. They were going towards Capernaum. That was their destination if you read in the book of John. See that in verse 21. So the disciples were in the boat. They were they were afraid. Jesus says, "You know, it is I." He gets to the water, to the boat. Winds are calmed. Then they go to the destination. So in the book of John, some of the information that's covered in Matthew isn't included in John, right? So I think I am done. Um, it is now 11:45.
Uh, I do have one more question. Um, if you go back to the beginning here, Jesus, uh, when Jesus had told the disciples to, to go onto the ship, while well, you know he had he had went to the other side and prayed. When Jesus prayed, was he praying to his Father? I understand he was praying, yes, as as, as his Father, but it was to himself, being God. The flesh is one hundred percent. He was one hundred percent man, being flesh, but he was also one hundred percent God. So his flesh was praying to his spirit, right? The size of the boat they were in, I'm not sure of. I don't think it really mentions it here. But if you see, it doesn't really say, it says ship, right? But it doesn't say the specific size of the, right? It doesn't say a specific size. Understand, uh, but you do have to remember, most of the translators, I mean, even if you go into the NKJV, it says boat, right? This says ship, right? This is, a ship is in reference to a bigger boat, right? The translator chose ship in this sense. Uh, I think I'm done. So let's go ahead and pray in closing. Brother Candido, can you pray? Push that button twice, thank you. That was great. Um, let's pray in closing. Thank God for your word. Thank God that we understand faith and we pray that you know we would all understand that word and keep it and understand it and not worry about what's going on in the world, but we would have faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen.